My name is Guion Foreman, president of the Chicago Police Board, and I'm calling the board's October 20th public meeting to order to protect the public's health in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is taking place remotely pursuant to the Illinois Opens Meeting Act. I have determined that holding this meeting in person is not practical or prudent. The city of Chicago remains subject to the governor's disaster proclamation due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the disease continues to be a threat, especially to the unvaccinated and people with certain health conditions. We are therefore having the meeting remotely this month. This meeting is open to the public via video and audio conference and is being carried live by CAN TV. Members of the public are on mute in order to reduce background noise and disruptions. We have a court reporter making a transcript of the meeting as well. In addition to police board members, we have several city officials here with us this evening. I will begin by taking attendance so it is clear who is participating in this meeting. Please say here after I read your name. Police Board Vice President Paula Wolf. Here. Board Member Stephen Block. Here. Board Member Morali Cusack. Here. Board Member Nanette Dorley. Here. Board Member Michael Eady. Here. Board Member Jorge Montes. Here. Superintendent of Police David Brown. Here. Chief Administrator of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, Andrea Kirsten. Here. Inspector General of the City of Chicago, Deborah Witzberg. Here. Chief of the Chicago Police Department's Bureau of Internal Affairs, Yolanda Talley. Here. Chief of the Bureau of Patrol, Brian McDermott. Here. Chief of the Bureau of Detectives, Brendan Dinahan. Here. Chief of the Office of Constitutional Policing and Reform, Angel, Angel Novales. Executive Director of CPD's Office of Constitutional Policing and Reform, Tina Scahill. Here, sir. General Counsel to the Superintendent, Dana O'Malley. Here. Deputy Mayor for Public Safety, Elena A little feedback here. Here. Mayor, thank you. Deputy Mayor for Public Safety, Elena Gottrich. Here. Executive Director of Police Board, Max Caproni. Here. Thank you. you will now Mr. President. To... Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I um, forgot to include uh, First Deputy Superintendent Eric Carter on your list, so that's my oversight. But I right. recognize he's here today. Thank you, First Deputy. Here, good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> we will now proceed to the items on the meeting agenda. We will have time at the end of the agenda for public comments. Once again, members of the public are currently on mute in order to reduce background noise and disruptions. When we get to the public comment portion of the meeting, we will unmute each speaker. There are currently vacancies on the Chicago Police Board. And as you may know, the city's new Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability is responsible for nominating candidates to the mayor. We are pleased to have with us this evening Commissioner Yvette Loison, who will speak about the open application process the commission is using to select its nominees. Commissioner. Thank you, President Foreman, and uh, thanks so much to you and all of your board members, um, not only for having me here tonight, but also for your great service to the city of Chicago. Um, I'm here tonight to advise everyone about the procedure that we have set up to ensure that members of the public can apply um, for the open positions on the police board. Um, historically, police board members have been chosen directly by the mayor, um, but now that the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability is responsible for filling, for assisting the mayor in filling those vacancies, um, we have recognized the importance of ensuring that all Chicagoans who um, are qualified have an opportunity to participate and so we have created an application process. Our application um, can be found on our website, 
Um, and I'm going to read that off so I don't say it wrong. Um, it's on the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability website, which you can find on www.chicago.gov in the government drop down men menu. If you click on Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability, um, there is a learn more link under a heading that says interested in serving on the police board. Um, the application is there and it has directions for whom you would electronically send it to via email once it is filled out. Um, the commission posted this police board application on October 7th, and we provided um, 30 days for individuals to fill out the application. So the applications are due by November 7th. That is our deadline. Um, once we receive the applications, there will be an interview process and ultimately members of the commission will make a recommendation to the mayor and then the mayor will ultimately choose members um, from the list of recommendations that we have sent to her. It is our great hope that qualified Chicagoans will recognize the importance of the police board and step up to serve. And once again, thanks to all of you for letting me be here tonight to share that information. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, to also make a, a, a pitch. Um, so I've served on the Chicago Police Board now for, for 12 years, a little bit over 12 years. And um, it is a very critical role. Um, you know, a lot of times we all have a part to play in this police accountability system. And it's something that um, it's important to all of us. And I think the, the new commission is a great example where uh, the community came together to say, that they wanted a larger voice in, in the, uh, the police accountability system. The police board is one of those opportunities where, where you get an opportunity to really understand some of the, the most important of the uh, um, issues when it comes to police accountability. And, and that's dealing with where police officers have been accused of, of breaking a rule. And that was the, anything from one year uh, where the suggestion is one year of uh, suspension all the way up to termination. Um, these are hard issues, right? And I think that it takes a diverse set of members to talk through these issues and, and really think through all of the issues in a very careful and thoughtful way. Um, and it requires, this is an opportunity where, where each of us, every Chicagoan now has the opportunity to be a part of the process and kind of get a chance to really see um, for themselves and, and be a part of this, this making this system better. And so strongly would encourage you. It's, uh, it's, it's not the kind of the job where, where somebody's patting you on the back every month and saying, oh, man, you guys made a great decision, but it's a really important role. Um, I think that I've, it's given me, me personally an opportunity to understand the challenging work that our police have every day and at the same time get an understanding of some of the challenges that community members are faced with and, and some of the things um, that we deal with, even on this monthly call, how we get a chance to to hear from community members. And it's it's one opportunity that we have to, to be a part, a direct part of uh, improving our system. So I would strongly encourage uh, people to uh, to apply. If you have questions, you certainly can reach out to us at the police board. We would be happy to, to speak with you about our experience and um, definitely would strongly encourage uh, Chicagoans to apply. So again, thank you so much commission and um, we'll be uh, available for, for anyone who has any additional questions. Um, thank you. We're also pleased this evening to have with us Elena Gottrich, the city's deputy mayor for public safety. Deputy Mayor Gottrich is here to speak for public safety priorities and initiatives. Deputy. Good evening. Thank you, President Foreman. Good evening, everyone. As the deputy mayor for public safety, my office is in charge of overseeing the police department, the fire department, OEMC, as well as all of our accountability and administrative functions, which includes the Public Safety Administration, the new Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability, COPA, as well as the Police Board. Mayor Lightfoot has stressed that public safety is not uh, exclusive to law enforcement and to the police. Public safety exists in an ecosystem. That means that we need to build up and build out all of our communities equitably and sustainably in order for public safety to be a lasting, meaningful thing in Chicago. 
accountability is central to this ecosystem because as we know, Chicagoans do not and will not feel safe if they do not have trust in the system and trust in their police officers. I have full faith in the police board and COPA and CCPSA and the police department. And I am encouraged by all of the collaboration and transparency and work that all of these bodies have done to push those messages out to the community. I apologize for sitting in the dark in my car. I'm sitting outside of a fundraiser for Chicago survivors, which I wanted to mention because it calls into question exactly why we do what we do. We, we fail if our Chicagoans are not kept safe and if they're faced with the trauma and the debilitative uh, effects that crime have on our community. So I want to thank the police department. I want to thank the police board. I want to thank COPA, the IG, the CCPSA, everybody that President Foreman introduced for doing your part to make public safety a priority in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Um, board, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the board's August 18th regular public, excuse me, shouldn't have been our August meeting. Give me one second. Let me look at this date. Um, September. Is there a motion to approve the board September 15th regular public meeting? Yeah, I appear to be frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Paula Wolf, I'd like to make that motion. Yes, Michael Eady, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Our next regular public meeting will be held Thursday, November 17th at 7.30 p.m. Whether this will be an in-person meeting or a remote meeting will be determined closer to the meeting date. The police board meets in executive session to consider personnel matters and litigation. Those discussions are closed to the public as authorized by sections 2C, 1, 3, 4, and 11 of the Illinois Open Meetings Act. A summary of items discussed in the executive sessions is posted in the minutes of the meetings on our website. Is there a motion to close future executive sessions as authorized by the Open Meetings Act? Paula Wolf, so moved. Michael Eady, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. We have two announcements of disciplinary rulings on the agenda tonight. Board Member Cusack and I will make these announcements. Board Member Cusack. Thank you. I was randomly selected from the police sports membership to consider one matter in which the chief administrator of the civilian office of police accountability and the superintendent of police did not agree regarding the discipline of two police officers. In request for review numbers 22, 20, and 21, the chief administrator recommended discipline for police officers Gregory Smith and Betty Whitfield of a suspension of 180 days up to and including. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. If, uh, if everyone can ensure that they're on mute so we can avoid background noise. Thank you. I was request, requested to review numbers 22-20 and 21. The chief administrator recommended discipline for police officers Gregory Smith and Betty Whitfield of a suspension of 180 days up to and including discharge from the Chicago Police Department for rule violations stemming from an attempt to stop a vehicle that fled and crashed. The superintendent did not agree with these recommendations and proposed less discipline for officers Smith and Whitfield. After considering this matter, it is my opinion that the superintendent did not meet the burden of overcoming the chief administrator's recommendations for discipline. A copy of the written opinion will be posted on the board's website as required by the municipal code. Thank you. 
I also was randomly selected for the police board's membership to consider one matter on which the chief administrator of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability and the Superintendent of Police did not agree regarding the discipline of a police officer. In request for review number 22-22, the Chief Administrator recommended that police officer Eric Stillman be discharged from the Chicago Police Department for violating CPD rules when he fatally shot Adam Toledo on March 29, 2021. The superintendent did not agree with this recommendation and proposed less discipline for Officer Stillman. I reviewed the chief administrator's recommendation, the superintendent's response, and the chief administrator's objections to the response. I also reviewed video recordings of the shooting, the CPD general order and foot pursuit bulletin and Officer Stillman's statement to COPA. The superintendent made a number of convincing points in his response to the chief administrator's recommendation. However, in this case, the material I reviewed does not provide a sufficient basis for me to rule that the superintendent met the burden to overcome the recommendation. It is my opinion, based on a thorough review of the material, the parties and the public will benefit from a full evidentiary hearing on this matter. And so referring this matter for a hearing before the police board is the appropriate next step. This hearing will allow the board to hear from use of force experts, the parties to call to testify, and will allow the board to thoroughly review relevant evidence, including video recordings of the incident. Officer Stillman will also be afforded the opportunity, opportunity to testify before the board, providing context and explanation surrounding the incident depicted on the video recording. Let me be clear, with this ruling, I am not saying that the chief administrator's recommendation is right and that the superintendent is wrong, nor am I saying that Officer Stillman should be suspended while this case is pending before the police board. Rather, I am saying that a police board hearing that provides due process to all parties is necessary to determine whether Officer Stillman violated any of the Chicago Police Department's rules of conduct, and if so, the appropriate disciplinary action. A copy of the written opinion will be posted on the board's website by the municipal code. Next, uh, superintendent, uh, if you can provide your report, please. Thank you, uh, President Foreman, and uh, thank you to all the um, police board members and, and guests. I also want to have a special acknowledgement of Deputy Mayor for Public Safety, Elna Gottrich, as well. Uh, the Chicago Police Department is committed to visibility, engagement, and collaboration. Uh, we are making significant progress in reducing gun violence in Chicago. Uh, homicides are down uh, 17%. Uh, that's 118 fewer victims of homicide this year compared to last year. And uh, shooting victims are down 21%. And that's 774 fewer victims of shootings this year compared to last year. Officers have taken over 10,000 guns uh, off the streets of Chicago, and every gun taken off the street is a potential life save. The department is also increasing its focus on motor vehicle theft around the city. Motor vehicle theft remains a key driver in other crimes such as robberies and drive-by shooting. The Bureau of Patrol and the Bureau of Detectives working together to leverage their assets to collaboratively address the issue and hold offenders accountable. In addition, we're also seeing progress in our increased presence across the CTA. Month to date, this month, October compared to October in 2021, uh, we're seeing violent crime uh, reducing by 17% and overall crime on the CTA month to date reduced by 19%. We'll work with the community and in the community. We know we have to, especially in our outreach efforts and recruitment efforts, uh, improve our ability to work with the community. Uh, this morning, just this morning, we began another round of in-person entrance exams for the department to hire new Chicago police officers. The exams will go through the weekend and take place at each of the city colleges of Chicago. Since the start of the year, we've uh, seen 693 recruits, new recruits hired um, 
for this year alone. That's more recruits higher than the last three years combined. I'll say that again, because we're making significant progress in our recruiting efforts. 693 recruits hired so far this year are the most we've hired um, the last three years combined. Uh, and it's a diverse uh, workforce that we're seeing come through uh, the ranks. Uh, every new recruit represents the next generation of this city's brave guardian. Uh, we'll offer our next round of in-person exams in uh, December of this year. Uh, as we continue recruiting at our historically black colleges and universities, uh, minority serving institutions and military bases across the country, uh, this past week, we were in the um, International Association of Chiefs of Police annual conference. Uh, I joined law enforcement leaders from around the world to discuss the issues our cities face. And not surprisingly, we all face the same issues across this country and internationally with uh, recruiting, with uh, gun violence. Um, so we are all in agreement that we must continue doing all we can to grow community trust. Uh, we know that's how we build an effective uh, department because trust and partnerships are crucial to enhancing public safety in Chicago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chief, Administ Chief Administrator Kirsten, if you'd like to provide your report, please. Thank you, President Foreman, and thank you to everyone uh, who's on the call this evening and all the departments and work that each of you represent individually. Uh, just to provide some general updates from COPA over the last month, we received 503 complaints and notifications of those 88 uh, remained under COPA's jurisdiction. And as I typically report out on, uh, we, we saw again in this last month that the highest uh, type of incident, the number one incident complained of uh, was at 29% of improper search and seizure or Fourth Amendment related allegations. Uh, there were three officer involved shooting notifications received in the last month. Uh, and then of all the cases that COPA closed in the last month, 12% of those cases involved sustained allegations of misconduct. Uh, <clears throat> something that I, I talk about frequently, the superintendent has certainly heard me say it, but it doesn't always feel obvious on nights like tonight. Uh, but the reality is COPA and the police department tend to agree on more than we disagree when it comes to these disciplinary cases. Um, and we saw that again this month with the cases that we closed. In addition to our recommendations and findings on investigations, uh, COPA also had two video releases under the city's, city's video release policy. And then we had 17 community engagement events that spanned all over the city. And one that I was particularly proud of was our final uh, vacant lot cleanup that we, we did as an agency in the South Shore community. That was an effort that we undertook over the last few months, um, sort of following the city's leadership and recognizing that the cleaning and greening of vacant lots contributes directly to all of our public safety. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to lift up that COPA was able to present before city uh, council earlier this week for our budget hearing and had the opportunity to highlight a lot of the, the good work that is underway at this agency. Um, <clears throat> one thing in particular that came up uh, out of that budget hearing, and again, is something that I've reported out on on this call uh, month, month over month, is that we have seen um, a significant uptick in cases year over year of officer initiated uh, complaints, whether they're reporting something that they witnessed a fellow officer doing or reporting out on something that a citizen uh, reported to them. I think what's important to recognize is not necessarily that this means there's exponentially more misconduct taking place, but instead that the principles of reform and accountability that the superintendent is leading his department towards are beginning potentially to take shape. And, and that is one um, outcome that we see in that data. And so just wanting to lift up the work of the department uh, in, those, in that regard that's led to those efforts and, and seeing those numbers shift in the last five years since COPA has been in existence. And then lastly, I'll just take this time um, because it is October and this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, domestic violence and cases of officer perpetrated domestic violence are something that are within COPA's jurisdiction. We have very talented and specialized staff uh, on our special victim squad that handle those cases specifically. Um, but what I think you know, is important again to remind people is that of course, domestic violence and, and gender-based violence and uh, family of violence extend into all corridors of, of our society. Um, it's kind of an inescapable uh, reality for many, many people. In fact, most likely people that you know. 
Um, however, I think what's unique about sort of some of COPA and CPD's approach to addressing that issue when it comes to the cases under our jurisdiction are two different things uh, that I'd like to highlight. Number one, COPA's intentional uh, exploration of partnership with the uh, Chicago Department of Public Health's interesting and unique and innovative new program called People That Do Harm. Uh, the original origin of the, pro the program was about creating non-carceral options uh, for counseling and other restorative principles for um, people that commit or perpetrate acts of domestic violence. But, and you might be wondering, why does this matter for COPA? We would like to be able to provide counseling resources for officers and provide an alternative to just straight disciplinary recommendations. So often in these cases, the survivor of the abuse uh, and the officer that had, may or may not have committed the abuse would benefit far more from counseling and some sort of restorative path uh, particularly if they're going to stay in a relationship. And so finding appropriate and you know, principled ways to achieve that is something that's really important to us as an agency. I just wanted to lift up that work. And then lastly, I know I've talked about this before, but CPD and COPA do something that is truly unique uh, in the way that we investigate both domestic violence allegations as well as sexual misconduct allegations. And that is conducting parallel investigations, CPD obviously handling and the very talented uh, officers that are assigned to the Bureau of Internal Affairs that handle the criminal investigation for those incidents. And then COPA and our special victim squad working alongside them to partner in interviews, sensitive interviews of the victims and survivors of these incidents uh, so that we can have one interview as opposed to two or three separate times that a victim has to come and tell his or her story. Uh, and so even just this week, we had multiple opportunities where we saw uh, BIA sergeants and detectives here at our offices uh, preparing for and executing sensitive trauma-informed interviews for survivors of some of those incidents. And I just really want to lift up the professionalism and the partnership that we uh, we have established, particularly under Chief Talley's leadership and all of the, the people that she has working on these critical issues. It is a service to our city to be doing this in ways that really try to think about the well-being of all parties involved. And I appreciate um, CPD's partnership in our efforts to do that. Uh, lastly, just thank you to everyone um, for the, the professionalism that we all demonstrate in this work, uh, especially month in and month out on these calls. I know these calls aren't always easy and these subjects aren't, um, they don't, these answers don't come easily to any of us, but I appreciate the professionalism that we all demonstrate uh, every month. So thank you all for your service. Thank you, Chief. I will now call upon members of the public who signed up in advance to speak. To make sure we have time to hear from all speakers, there is a two minute time limit on comments. Our first speaker is Mia Bonds. Please press star six. So my name is Mia and I'm speaking on behalf of the um, Chicago Youth Organizing to Trauma Hills Council. We're a group of youth advocate, advocating for police accountability. And we're doing some of our updates um, from our council. So the first one is that we are currently recruiting for new members for our council. Um, anyone from the ages of 16 to 25 who's interested in police accountability can apply for our council. And then also we are planning our next community events, which will actually be around voter registration. And that's our updates. All right, thank you. Where where can one find uh, find the application? Um, on our Instagram, which is um, CYCPA underscore. CYCPA underscore on Instagram for any uh, young people who are interested in applying or for anyone who wants to encourage uh, any of their young people to apply. Thank you, Mia. Our next speaker, Krista Noel. Ms. Noel, if you could press star six. Yes, hi, how's everybody? Um, Okay, so I, um, my organization is very concerned about the amount of police violence that's happened against women recently. And so we'll probably be addressing that and speaking out for the victims very soon. Um, I did wanna say that the police department has nothing to do with funding for the folks that have been affected by violence. Um, and it sounded as if, um, the deputy mayor was thanking them for <laughs> something like that. 
Um, one of the concerns I have right now is that a uh, it's come to uh, our attention, the consent decree coalition, that a black man named Elijah was driving a rather expensive car uh, and was stopped and surrounded by police who arrested him, even though he had a conceal and carry um, permit. So uh, we're wondering if he has been released at this point, and we're also wondering why he was arrested when he had a permit. Um, I can follow up with you to get a little bit more additional details, Krista. Um, if, if maybe Max can follow up with you, get some more specifics on that one. And and we can uh, coordinate from there. Okay, I've got video, so I'll send the video and the pictures to Max, so he can uh, see, you know, how many police officers surrounded one man in an expensive car. Um, but you know, we we consider this quite ridiculous. And you know, if you're going to arrest us, even though we have conceal and carry and permits. And you're going to kill us, even though we have FOIA cards and stuff. We really need to to have some sit down conversations about how the police department is responding to black people with legal weapons. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker, Anna Santoyo. Anna Santoyo, if you could press star six to unmute. All right, our next speaker, Eunice. Can you hear me? Yes, can, can you hear you? Good Hello? evening. Good evening. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so first I want to express my deepest condolences uh to the family of Adam Toledo. The fact that this case is being brought to an entire police board shows that Superintendent David Brown's decision making process is flawed. Um, he has defended Proud Boy member Robert Baker from being fired. He protected Evan Solano and Sammy Encarnacion. And he has been consistent in his defense of the cops that murder. The fact that David Brown recommended a five-day suspension for the killing of a teenager, a 13-year-old child. This is the public time to speak. And, at, and David Brown should know that he should be ashamed, ashamed of himself that he thinks that a CPD only deserves a five-day suspension. That is his recommendation. Um, as a fitting punishment for shooting a child. The decision raises numerous questions about Anthony Alvarez's case. If using similar arguments to defend Eric Stillman, Evan Solano's were used uh, how, how a single board member allowed to decide that Evan Solano should be cleared. Anthony, at the very least, um, serves the same treatment. A full open review and investigation must be started into the handling of Anthony Alvarez's murder. Allegation five that's listed in the report is the exact same allegation that Evan Solano was cleared of by Stephen Block on this board. The inconsistencies with these two rulings show exactly why an unelected mayor appointed superintendent and police board cannot be the arbiter of justice. The facts of this case is clear. Adam Toledo is gone. Anthony Alvarez is gone. Killer cops Evan Solano, Sammy Encarnacion, and Eric Stillman are still employed when they should be fired and charged. Sorry, your time is up. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to, to, um, to address some of the comments that I just heard. Um, this is a challenging issue, right? And, and I was faced with the decision that board member Block was faced with a couple of weeks ago in, in making this decision. And again, it's not to say that the decision that I made is a right one. I struggled a lot with this in, the, in much in the same way that, that Stephen uh, struggled with this decision. I One thing I will agree with is that this process is flawed. I do not believe that it should be up to one board member to make this decision. It was a hard decision. 
Um, I lost nights of sleep. Stephen lost nights of sleep over over making this decision. So if there's one thing that I will agree with, it, it is that uh, the superintendent has challenging uh, decision that he has to make. COPA has a challenging decision that they have to make with these cases. And despite what the public may think from reading a few paragraphs or, or seeing uh, something on television, the details that we get is a lot more than what uh, the public gets a chance to see in great detail. And so, um, Superintendent, I, I, I understand the challenge that you have when making these decisions. Chief Administrator, I understand the tough decisions. So the thing that I would like us to consider both as a board, uh, as residents of the city of Chicago, a recommendation to um, our city council is that we take a good look at this rule about one person making the decision. I don't think it's fair to the public. I don't think it's fair to the officers. And I don't think it's fair to the members of the police board, right? Um, it opens us up uh, to public criticism, which is unfair. Um, and yet it's something that we have to do. And so I think Stephen was very brave for the decision that, that he made a couple of weeks ago. And I continue to stand by the decision that he made. Um, there's going to be people who didn't like his decision. There's going to be people who don't like my decision. And I understand that when we step up to uh, to serve in this role that comes with the job. So for those who are applying for this this incredible position, this honor of serving the people of Chicago, this is what we have to live with. And so um, so, uh, you know, I know typically I, I wouldn't respond directly to your comments. And, and I, I think that you're absolutely have the right to to make the comments in the way that you that you feel but i think there's a lot more nuance to it um our next speaker eunice chapman regis hello can you hear me yes ma'am. can you hear me yes ma'am okay good evening. good evening i'm an active member representing 79th Everhart block club and coalition of chatham area block club our concerns continue to involve Family Fresh Meat Market, 457 East 79th Street. But the lack of improvement in the quality of life in our neighborhood. I've been making presentations from the board since September 2020. Same issue. Nevertheless, no change in the unacceptable, unacceptable activities. If anything, things have gotten worse. Last night, there were 18 rounds. Sound like an automatic rifle in our area. Um, there still exists sell cigarettes, loitering, even though there's no trespassing signs. A posted uh, store of 457 East 79th has been closed due to violence and health violations. Opened again under different family names. 440 East 80th Street, still young black men and women are squatters in that building. The building was boarded up. Police come, said they can't do anything. I've seen the squatters at 44. Zero East 80th Street, entering and leaving the board, and it's boarded up. 443 East 80th Street has squatters, young black males. They allegedly steal cars and hide them over there. They dress in black and white tops and black bottoms. Sometimes they wear red baseball caps. They carry black book bags. I'm not sure of that gym shoe color. 7905 to 7909 Eberhardt, multi apartment building, increased loitering and selling of drugs outside the building. They got crazy. They sit on, they leave there overnight. There are no so loitering signs posted on the building. And also there's no owner of the building listed. And that's mysterious and unacceptable because that's a law, a building code violation. You're supposed to have the owner's contact number posted on the building if they don't live at the property. Our safety and quality of life are compromised and threatened because many families live on our block. 7900 South Everhart. I'm sorry, your time is up. Um... Uh, so can you please coordinate? Uh, there was a lot of issues taking place in in, uh, in Ms. Chapman Regis's conversation. One yeah, thing I'd like the opportunity to get a uh, follow up either through Max. So our chief of patrol, Chief McDermott, who's on this uh, meeting, uh, can follow up and, and get some action done over there, with particularly with the hanging out and, and some of the allegations that I heard from Ms. Chapman. 
Great, thank you. And and if we could coordinate with the buildings department to ensure that the, the one residential address to make sure that that contact information is available. She's right, that is supposed to be posted. So if there are some simple, uh, some simple fixes that we can take care of, I think that would be great for us to do so. We'll be right on it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Lolita Hendricks. Ms. Hendricks, if you can press star six, please. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Lolita Hendricks, and I'm calling in regards to the murder uh, of my niece, Treasure Nicole Hendricks. She was found dead in an RV vehicle owned by police officer or no longer police officer, Charlie Bell. He was allowed by the police department to retire um, seven days after her murder. There was no um, full investigation done. Um, I still await a response from the September 22nd police board meeting where I asked for transparency on the closure of my niece's death investigation. Um, the officer who closed the case, Detective Montanaro, um, had to get approval from someone, but um, how could he have gotten approval for a case closed when no one ever talked to the family, no one ever talked to our friends, no one ever talked to Treasure's friends? We grieve, we mourn, and we want justice for her lost life. Um, we found her at the morgue. No one called us. Nobody told us anything. We did it on a lark. So it is not an easy call that I'm making tonight, but I feel like somebody is responsible for her lost life. Not only that, um, Copa was there. They did an autopsy on her and all of these people were present. We didn't get any information. So our question is, who is responsible and why has no one reached out to the family? So first, my condolences to, to you and the family. Uh, Superintendent or Chief Dinahan, is there anything specific that, that you can uh, speak to? It's just probably more appropriate to follow up offline. I'm, I'm not sure when all of this happened, but we'll certainly dedicate the resources to follow up and find out some more details about uh, this case. Okay. So um, Max uh, or Jasmine, can you ensure that uh, Superintendent gets uh, Ms. Hendricks' contact information. Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. Sir, sir next... you can find me. Uh, uh... No, we're 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 on a we're live, and we'll we have your contact information. We'll make sure that that we pass it along. We don't necessarily want to thank do that. You. I appreciate. It. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker, Evangel Yanubian. Evangel Yanubian. If you can press star six. Um, our final speaker is Robert Moore. Mr. Moore, if you can press star six on one of your phones, yes. not both. Mr. Foreman, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I was going to specifically address the Chicago's children in this conveyance and also the federal grand jury for per grand per person, for person, but I have to um, put that on hold right now. This is not my name. When, when one country is under attack, all things other than its defense must be given second place. DVD Ray M. Torres, March 1937, Pope Pius XI. It is now with 464 months since Robert J. Moore began the practice of mental prayer. Uh, but cannot get into this oral conveyance is scheduled to be posted at JN21 15 CRO PCR. TriPi.com slash CHIPOL PDRJM 1020 PC.html. RJM is present this plaintiff. From the moral theological formula of hell, this is the doctrine of the double effect, strong five, this plaintiff. As a lesser defect of Catholic, the least poet, last of the sites of Jesus Christ, RGM here averts that RGM does not concede the continued existence and operation of any nominal government entity ultimately controlled via whatever truth is intermediary in any given instance by the present incarnation of the Committee of the 300, but rather acknowledges the moral obligation to get any and all such type entities eliminated and the key possible at the accomplishment of such type objectives to get Catholic compatible with white and square for respectively established. But I super, the superintendent is present at the meeting, correct? 
Correct. The superintendent prison. Okay, yeah, yes, got here's gun violence. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get try to get this in. Gun violence from what source of authority the authority been confirmed slash derived according to which the term gun violence, quote unquote, has been and ever would be used by you in the conveyance that conveys the intolerant law from the office you now occupy. In light of the estimated three hundred to four hundred million human beings killed by their own government respectively in the twentieth century, according to Universal Wide Professor R. J. Rummel. The vast majority of which killings were perpetrated by disarmed and or otherwise unarmed citizens. How could it possibly be justified to use the term gun violence rather than the term gun control violence? Gun control work at the experts, Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. The, the vilification, demonization of guns, guns is what keeps us free, okay? And the, the capacity, military capacity, the right to keep with their arms. That is a precious, precious. I'm sorry, Mr. Moore, your time is up. Um, at this time, all members of the public who signed up to speak have been called. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Paul Wolf. Second, Michael Weedy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good evening.